Um, but it is my great honor to introduce Jake Cetera, who has been a PhD student here with me um, since 2014. He's my first student, and he is absolutely brilliant, as you will come to see throughout this lecture. Um, he's been working on the Bushveld Complex in South Africa, um, and he's going to talk a lot about some of the really cutting-edge new techniques that we're throwing at these layered intrusions. And layered intrusions, you know, have sort of captivated our interest for a long time, but only with these new methods that Jake is going to bring to the table are we going to start to learn really exciting new implications for how these things are constructed and cooled. Um, Jake got his undergraduate degree in 2012 from the University of New Hampshire. Then he stuck around for a little while to work um, as the manager of the Clean Lab as they were setting up their um, super fancy Clean Lab over there. Then he came to Rutgers and um, had to deal with Clean Lab issues here as well, um, but has also been really instrumental in helping me set up the laser ablation ICPMS lab that we have upstairs, which plenty of you have already interacted with him on, and he does a great job of helping me manage that facility as well. So this is not Jake's thesis, but it contains significant elements of his thesis, so um, it's not an excuse not to come to his thesis defense. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, potentially in the spring, but we'll let him decide when that's going to happen. All right. Take it away, Jake. Thanks, Jill. Should we screw up the lights? Or oh, yeah. I don't, know how to... I don't know how to do it either, but we'll just push a bunch of buttons. Oh. Just push the lower what could go wrong? The lowest. Bottom one. The lowest. Yes. All right, cool. That works. Well, thanks, Jill, and thanks for everybody uh, coming. Um, so the title of my talk is The Thermal Evolution of the World's Largest Layered Intrusion, uh, the Bushveld Complex. Um, and just to, to dive right in, um, I want to first convince you that layered intrusions are really cool and important. Um, so folks have been working on layered intrusions for the last 50 years or so. In fact, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of a seminal book by uh, Wager and Brown um, with a workshop in South Africa this summer that both Aidan Taylor and I attended. Um, and then, but you know, it's the, the field has sort of had a revival um, as of late because of new analytical te uh, techniques and some new ideas. And just to kind of show that, this is one of the recent uh, editions of the Elements um, magazine, which was uh, Jill was the gu guest editor on, um, that was entirely about layered intrusions. And I just love the cover photo because it starts to show you some of the, d the distinct, almost sediment sedimentary-like layering um, that makes up these layered intrusions. So this picture is from um, the scare guard intrusion um, in Greenland. Um, so they've been studied for a while, but, but why exactly are they studied? Why are they important? What, what draws, us, draws us to them? So just in, a, in, in an introductory sense, um, they're fundamental to understanding magmatic differentiation in the crystallization of magmas. So um, this is just your standard um, intro level uh, cartoon of a magma chamber uh, below an eruptive uh, volcano. And you can envisage or envision just the basic scenario of a basaltic magma rising through the rising through the crust, stalling out, creating a stagnant magma chamber where it starts to cool. And then once we start to, to have cra fractional crystallization, the first things we start to crystallize in that magma chamber are the mafic mineral phases. So things that are high in magnesium, uh, low in silica. Um, and those can start to settle to the bottom and you start to form rocks. Uh, mafic rocks like this, like a gabbro, okay? Um, but that liquid that's still in that magma chamber starts to fractionate. It becomes lower in magnesium and higher in silica. And as the process continues, if that, if that liquid can escape, you might form extrusive rocks um, that are more felsic, like an andesite, okay? So we know this, we know this process happens, um, but what are the ways we can study it throughout the process? Um, and that's actually pretty hard. We can do it through experimental petrology, um, but if we want to do it in situ, layered intrusions are one way to do that. So that's cooling this magma chamber down entirely to its all solid, and then uplifting it to the surface and eroding it so we can see um, all of the stratigraphy from the bottom to the top. So that's why people refer to them as natural laboratories a lot, because they're, they're a natural laboratory to investigate processes like magmatic differentiation and how magmas actually crystallize. Um, they're also important because they're host to some of the world's largest known sources of precious metals, like copper, nickel, 
PGE, which is platinum group element resources, uh, chromium, vanadium, et cetera. Um, and here's just two photos from our, our field work back in 2014, where we had a day where we got to go underground, underground at one of the platinum mines. Um, and here, uh, this is one of the fresh faces that they're actively mining. And they're mining this, this black layer here. That's pretty fine grain. This is a chromatite layer called the UG2 chromatite in the Bushfeld complex. And below that, there's a coarse pegmatite, which they're not mining, but it's usually found below the UG2. Um, and that picture on the right is just proof that I was actually there <laughs> and that it actually is really dark underground. This is one of our colleagues, Alex, who is uh, there collecting samples for his own, his own research. Um, so I've shown you some of the distinct layering in that first picture of the Skirgard intrusion. Um, and I've shown you that they have some world-class ore deposits. Um, so here's just another example of some of the layering. This is the UG1 chromatite, which is also in the Bushfeld complex. Um, this is actually a world uh, heritage site, so it's, it's a world famous outcrop. They're, you're not allowed to hammer. Um, but again, very distinct layering um, throughout these anorthosites. Um, so these are chromatite veins forming within a anorthosite. Um, so this distinct layering, and then also some of the coarse grain sizes. So here's some coarse grain stuff from the critical zone below the UG2. Um, this has all previously been thought to form as a result of very slow cooling. So you have these massive igneous bodies that cool slowly and form distinct layering, coarse grain sizes, and ore deposits. Um, and just to further kind of exemplify that, here's just two quotes from a couple papers almost a decade apart, uh, both about the Bushfeld complex. Uh, the first, 1995, um, the different zones cooled below the Curie temperature of magnetite over a time span of at least 50 million years, if not longer. So these authors uh, think that the Bushfeld, the whole thing, did not reach the Curie temperature of 580 degrees until for at least 50 million years. That's a pretty long duration. And then uh, in 2007, this was a paper more about PGE resources, but along the same lines, one can imagine that the Bushfeld complex would have remained at temperatures of more than several hundred degrees Celsius for millions of years. So that's just to, to set the stage that this is how people have thought that layered mafic intrusions have cooled, that it has to be, has to be slow. Um, but have we ever been really able to test that? And, and the answer is no until very recently. So increased precision and improved geochronologic uh, methods have allowed us to start to investigate these questions and potentially answer them. Um, and it's also led to a lot of new questions that can be asked. And some of these are controversial. And just as a, just to show you kind of where the field is going, I just want to show you this sort of recent paper um, that was in Nature Communications about the Bushfeld Complex. Uh, it was by Jim Mungle. Um, and they were dating a bunch of zircons throughout the stratigraphy um, using the uranium lead system. And this is just one example of an age, a weighted mean age that they, that they obtained um, that came out to 2055.68 million years, plus or minus 200,000 years. Okay, so that's the sort of precision that at least the uranium lead community is starting to, to get to. Um, but with that precision comes the chance for more questions, more questions than answers. And, you know, one of the quotes from this paper um, that comes with this added precision is, our uranium lead ages and modeling necessitate reassessment of the genesis of layered intrusions and their ore deposits and challenge even the venerable concept of the magma chamber itself. So uh, I'm not going to say if this is right or not because I have my own opinions about it, but um, the idea is that these new techniques are leading us in a direction where there's a lot more research that can be done. Um, but that was about crystallization, okay? Um, what happens post-crystallization? What is happening in the subsolidus? Do those cooling regimes matter? Um, why are they important? And they are. And just one example of why it's important is I just want to show you, um, here's a schematic figure from Mungle et al. and Naldra about the formation of PGE deposits. So those are, again, platinum group element resources. And the two I want you to focus on, it's a little busy, but just uppers and downers. These are two two general approaches to how PGEs form. And we'll start with the downers. Um, this is mostly a magmatic process. So, so in the downers scenario, you have a magma in a magma chamber that's fractionating. Um, and at some point, either the pressure changes within the magma chamber or you add in new magma and you have a mixing event. And because of those events, 
you start to crystallize sulfides or PGE. That then settles to the floor of the chamber and you accumulate um, a vein or a chromatite or a reef. Um, and that's where you get something like the UG2. So that's just one, you know, one end member scenario, the downers approach. Then there's the uppers approach, which is a post-magmatic formation. So this occurs when you have percolating fluids, hot fluids, coming up through solid rock. Okay? And that's leaching out PGE from the, from the cumulus phases that have already crystallized. And at some point they hit a boundary and precipitate that PGE layer in place. So this is more of a post-crystallization event. Um, so you can imagine that knowing how this body cools down will uh, help infer if this is possible or what time scales are needed for this to actually happen. Um, and then if you're, if you're Sonia or Dennis and you care about paleomagnetism and stuff that happens around the Curie temperature um, at 580 degrees, you should really know something about the subsolidus uh, cooling regime of the body that you're, that you're investigating. So that's what we want to do. We want to start to uh, deduce what the thermal histories are of these layered mafic intrusions from the crystallization temperatures, or from crystallization of zircon um, down through lower temperatures. And how are we going to do that? Um, well, we're going to do that using geochronology. And more importantly, the fact that different chronom chronometers have different closure temperatures. So here's just a, a schematic figure. You've probably seen this a bunch of times from Jill and myself. Um, on the x-axis is duration, duration of cooling getting longer to the right, and the y-axis is temperature. Um, and this is just to show that different dating systems represent different temperatures. So here's uranium lead and zircon. So when you get a uranium lead, a uranium lead age from a zircon, it represents the age at a certain temperature. And that temperature is about 800 to 900 degrees Celsius. It's when the zircon crystallized. But there's other dating systems, like the argon-argon system, which has various closure temperatures for various mineral phases. So the argon-argon dating of amphiboles, around 500 degrees. The argon-argon dating of biotites, around 300 to 450. And of plagioclase, it's around 175 to 300. So you can imagine if we have um, different cooling paths, so these are just four generic uh, cooling paths, we can start to infer which ones are possible and which ones are not uh, by seeing if there's age differences um, between these two chronometers. Okay? So for instance, this cooling path, you expect to get a plagioclase age, which is you know, a million years younger than the zircon. Or if it's this cooling path, it's more like two. Um, so that's the general, the general idea of what we want to do. And we're going to investigate this on the Bushfeld complex. And why the Bushfeld complex? Uh, well, let me first tell you why, how it stands out compared to the rest. So here's just a, a global map. And I'm going to show you some of the most well-known, well-studied layered intrusions of the world. Um, and they'll be scaled by, by size. Okay? So there's the Skaragard in Greenland. And this is just a estimated surface exposure size. Uh, there's the Kigel plate, so we're getting a little bit larger. The Great Dake in Zimbabwe, uh, Muskox intrusion, Stillwater complex, which I hope grad students remember we, we went to for a day. Uh, the Duluth complex, the Dufec, which is starting to get large, that's in Antarctica. Aidan Taylor's uh, currently working on that. Um, I'll steal his thunder a little bit, though, and, and say that we're not quite sure if it's one full intrusion or if it's actually two smaller ones. Um, so it might not be as large as, as that. Um, but then there's by far the largest, um, the Bushfeld complex. Um, and just on the, the face of it, you start to wonder, is some, something this large, with that much magma, um, has to cool slowly, right? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, so just a little detail on the Bushfeld. Here's a generic geologic map um, and an inset of South Africa showing you where the complex is in the northeast portion of the country. Um, so the Bushfeld complex intruded into the Transvaal group sediments, which are this white outlined area. Um, those are about 2.6 billion years old. Um, it crops out predominantly in three major limbs, the western limb, eastern limb, and the northern limb. The lateral extent of the complex is about 450 kilometers east-west um, and 100 
and 50 to 200 kilometers north south. So it's a huge footprint. Um, and it's up to nine kilometers thick in places. Uh, it's made up, I should also note that the two limbs dip gently towards each other currently. And they're inferred to connect at depth. And that's based on some gravity surveys as well as lithologic and geochemical um, relationships between the two limbs at the same stratigraphic levels. Um, and then finally, there's, there's four major portions of the Bushveld complex. Um, there's the, the stuff that's on the top of the stratigraphy, which we're not going to really focus on, but there's a granite, a granophere, and the Royberg lavas. Um, and then there's this black shaded region, which is the Rustenberg layered suite. And that's the most voluminous part of the Bushveld complex, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of this talk, and specifically focusing on the eastern, the eastern limb, because that's where most of the field outcrops actually are. So again, just to recap, it's the largest layered intrusion, contains most of the world's PGE resources, and um, some authors note that it could represent up to a million cubic kilometers of magma and placed into the shallow crust. So like I said, we're going to focus on the RLS, uh, which is the Rustenberg Layered Suite. From now on, I'm probably going to refer to this as the RLS. So when I say that, I mean the Rustenberg Layered Suite, which is the predominantly uh, cumulate mafic and ultra mafic rocks of the Bushveld complex, which in general represent uh, more evolved rocks through time. So um, upwards through the stratigraphy, and this is a generic stratigraphic column of the eastern limb of the RLS, and this is from Van Togren et al. 2013. Um, we generally have more mafic compositions at the bottom and more felsic compositions at the top. Um, you'll notice it's broken up into four major zones. These are based off of cumulus mineral assemblages. Uh, so the lower zone is mainly peroxinites and harzburgites, so you have a lot of pyroxene and olivine. The critical zone is a little bit more complicated with lots of rock types, so I won't get into all of them, but I do like to note that there are two chromatite seams in the critical zone, the UG2 and the Marensky Reef, which if you combine them together, are the biggest PGE resource in the world. Um, the main zone is, main, is sometimes up to three kilometers thick. It's a massive gabbro gabbro uh, interval. And the upper zone is defined by the first appearance of cumulus uh, magnetite. And like I said, although it's, although it's complicated, um, it's generally uh, a transition from more mafic things to the, at the bottom to a more evolved composition at the top. And I said on the previous slide that it's estimated to be about a million cubic kilometers of magma. Okay. Well, it's also estimated that that was all in place within 75,000 years. So a pretty short time frame. That's an average emplacement rate on the order of 13 cubic kilometers per year. Uh, to put that into context, we have a super volcano nearby, Yellowstone. Also hope the graduate students remember we went there. Um, that has an estimated emplacement rate of around five meters, five cubic meters, not kilometers, per year. So the point is we're placing a huge volume of magma really fast into the shallow crust. And how fast do we cool that off? And how do we still produce the, these distinct layers um, and ore deposits is, is a, major, a major question. Now, like I mentioned, we're going to try to com uh, come at this problem through geochronology. So the first place to start is with the published geochronology. This is empty right now, but that's just because you're going to see this a lot and I want to get you oriented on the figure. <coughs> so age is on the x-axis. We're getting going from older to younger. Um, from left to right, okay? And then the y-axis is depth, and this is going to be generally correlated to the stratigraphic column of the eastern limb of the RLS, okay? And then again, the zones I just explained to you are just the four major zones of the, of the stratigraphy. Um, so now I'm going to put up the high temperature geochronology. So this is going to be uranium lead ages of zircon and bedelliate. But Deliate has the same closure temperature as zircon, so you can treat them uh, the same. They represent the same temperature interval um, with the age dating. So here's the published zircon and Bedelia ages. First thing you might notice is that there's limited or intermittent ages throughout the stratigraphy. There's only a single age in the upper zone, a couple of ages for, for zircon in the lower critical zone, um, and then a bunch of ages 
Uh, this is actually supposed to be in the upper critical zone. I don't know what happened with that figure. But uh, this is all around the Marensky Reef and where the economically valuable um, chromatite layers are. And then there's a couple of ages in the marginal zone, which is considered the chilled margin um, of the complex. So it's, you can't really find it everywhere through the stratigraphy. Um, it's really located to where mining companies will, will pay for it and give you samples. Um, another observation you might make is that they're all fairly consistent throughout the stratigraphy, which implies two things. One, that the entire body was in place rapidly, which we've already, we've already noted. And two, that the entire body must have cooled to around 800 degrees um, when these crystallize at roughly the same time. Um, but again, this is crystallization. We want to focus on the subsolidus thermal history. And as a reminder of how we're going to do that, uh, we're looking at geochronometers that have lower closure temperatures than the uranium lead system. And in particular, we're going to focus on the argon-argon system in biotite. And before I do that, we have to have a quick one slide refresher of argon-argon dating. Um, so 40 potassium is based on 40 potassium naturally decaying to 40 argon. Um, we then send our samples out to a nuclear reactor. This is the USGS Triga reactor, which we use occasionally. Um, and that, we bombard a sample with neutrons and we turn 39 potassium into 39 argon in our samples. Then with the mass spectrometer we have upstairs on the third floor, we can measure the 40 argon, 39 argon ratio and calculate an age. Um, and we do this through a step heating process. So we don't just zap the sample once um, and get an age, we zap it incrementally at higher and higher temperatures. And that gives us a wealth of information and produces a figure like this. Um, I'm not gonna get into this figure too much, but just um, to kind of fill you in, because we'll see a bunch of them. The x-axis is the cumulative 39 argon release during an experiment, and age is on the y-axis. And you'll see that there's a bunch of letters here. Each one of those letters is an individual heating step during an experiment. So each heating step, these are low temperature, and then we increase the heat progressively until the sample is completely melted. Each heating step produces an age, okay? So we can see um, the tr how the age progresses through the sample. This is the plateau age. This is our best estimate of when this mineral passed through its appropriate closure temperature. And then the integrated age, if any of you are familiar with, with potassium argon dating, this is analogous to potassium argon dating. So if we were to just zap the mineral one time and melt it completely and measure all the gas that came off, this would be roughly what the potassium argon age was. So argon argon dating uh, provides us with a lot more information than we used to be able to get using the potassium argon method. So let's add in the published biotite argon argon data um, from the Bushveld. That's it. Um, there's only two published data, data points. One is uh, a weighted mean of about 10 analyses from the UG2 chromatite. Um, that was by Nomad et al. It comes out to about 2050 million years, so about 5 million years younger than the uranium lead system. Um, that's about an average cooling rate of 100 degrees per million year. Uh, the other data point is not a weighted mean. It's just a single biotite age. Um, it's also from a chromatite um, in the western limb of the RLS. Um, and it comes out just about to the same, the same age. So you'll notice there's a lot of white space on this figure, and that's that's partially on purpose. Um, the, the idea, the takeaway idea here is that no one has dated this stratigraphy um, of the RLS. This is about nine kilometers thick and the only low temperature chronometers we have are from two chromatite veins in the, in the critical zone. And a bunch of authors have already shown, including the chronology by Mungle et al, I, I prefaced earlier with, that the chromatites are weird. Um, the majority of this stratigraphy is gabbros and gabbronorites, and we've only dated two, two chromatites. So what Jill and I set out to do was fill in this stratigraphy with as many ages as we can. So see if we can cover um, a good portion of this stratigraphy and really get at um, the low temperature thermal evolution. Uh, so to do that, we had to go do some extensive sampling. Uh, so we went for about a month, I think, in August of 2014. Um, there's sort of three ways you can get samples 
um, from the eastern limb. One is if you go to a mine um, and they're nice enough to give you samples and let you use the coordinates. Um, but we weren't able to do that. At least none of, the, none of the samples I have are from any mine. So we drive around looking for outcrops, um, which is not a trivial task either. So we spent about four days trying to do a, a transect of the main zone. And this is what a lot of the outcrops look like. Um, so you can imagine trying to get a fresh sample from this. Um, so it took, it took a while. Um, I don't even know if we took one from here or we gave up, but um, it's, not, it's not a trivial task. And then there's the lower zone where we get peroxinites um, and Harzbergites, and we actually have some topography. So here it's a little bit easier. Um, this is Aiden's in this picture. This is actually from this past summer when we were out there um, collecting a couple more samples. Uh, so how did we do sampling? Um, well, again, the idea is that we wanted to cover as much of the stratigraphy as we could um, and separate individual biotate grains from these samples. Um, so we got 10 samples um, that were kind of evenly spaced. They cover about 5.5 kilometers of stratigraphy uh, from the upper zone down through just through the lower part of the upper critical zone. Um, and here they are just on the, the map of the eastern limb. As you move from west to east, you move down in stratigraphy. So these three samples are the upper zone, these are the, the main zone transect, and then here are the two from the, from the critical zone. Uh, so we, we've covered a, a good amount of the stratigraphy. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any biotites um, in the lower zone samples that we, that we collected. Um, I should also note that like zircon and the bedelliate for that matter, Biotite is an interstitial phase in these rocks. So they're likely part of the last liquid to crystallize in the sample. Um, but luckily, due to the very low subsolid disclosure temperature, about 350 degrees, um, if it's a closed system, we can assume that the age we get represents when this whole sample passed through this cooling temperature. Um, so starting to get to the results, I'll start off with, with the, the nice ones. Um, one of the first ones I dated, they all came out, they were coming out great. There's two types of age spectra. Uh, there's ones like this that are concordant. Uh, that means that almost 100% of the gas that comes off the sample lies along the same plateau age. Um, and your plateau age and your integrated age are indistinguishable from one another. So this, is, this was a good sample. It was the upper zone sample. Then you have some that look like this, which are discordant. Uh, this one's not bad either, but it is discordant. So we have these young apparent ages at the beginning of the experiment, um, and then we form a plateau age at the end. Um, and these, these young apparent ages can happen for a, very, a variety of reasons. Could be a reheating event later in the sample's history where it's heated above its closure temperature, or it could be from chlorite interlayering. Um, and I just want to spend a second focusing on this chlorite interlayering part because I feel like this is... Uh, Part of the reason why people have struggled to date the Bushveld to date, because I know I've talked to a number of colleagues at meetings, and they've always said that it's, uh, it's a challenge and they can't do it. Um, so here's one of the age spectra I got early on that, that scared me and made me think I was never going to finish. Um, so I have eight of these total. We dated 30 individual biotite grains, and eight of them sort of looked like this. Um, where you get really young ages at the beginning of the, eight, of the age spectra, and then anomalously old ages um, at the end. So this one actually formed a plateau, but it's at 2.1 billion years old. We know the zircons are 2.05 billion years old, and they come from relatively the same samples, so this is really geologically not possible. Um, so what gives? Um, doing a little research, uh, I found out that this is typical of argon-39 recoil, um, into interlayered chlorite. So everybody is familiar with mica being a phyllosilicate, right? You've all peeled apart the layers. Um, well, um, you can also start to form chlorite within those layers. Um, and that's what we found in some of these samples. So here's a, a backscatter image of a, a biotite grain. Um, and you can start to see the layering is going across the screen here. And these light areas are chlorite. And you're also forming some on the outer rims. Um, I'm going to throw up some formulas here. Don't get scared or run away. I only want to point out that biotite has potassium and chlorite does not. Okay? So remember, when we send these samples out to the reactor, 
we're forming argon-39 from potassium. So the biotite's hosting potassium, and that's where all the 39 is going to be created. But the 39 is immediately going to want to leave uh, the biotite and go into the interlayered chloride because there's a lot of space. So what happens is um, in early heating steps, we are degassing chloride primarily, which has a lot of extra 39 because it just came from the biotite. So we get young ages. And then at the high heating steps, we're degassing biotite, which is giving us really old ages because the 39 that it's supposed to have has left and gone into the chloride. So it's coming out here. And this is not unheard of. So um, the paper by Nomad et al. from 2004, they were dating the UG2 with argon-argon for biotite. They found that about 50% of their samples were concordant, and the other 50% were discordant, and that was due to chlorite being interlayered in the biotite. Um, so they produced their discordant data looked like this, which is almost exactly what, what my data looks like. Um, those authors, though, because they couldn't, uh, they just discarded it. So all their discordant data they, they published, but it did not go into any of their age calculations. So any weighted means did not include any of this data. So they potentially lost out on, on half a data set. But with increased precision, um, we can actually start to correct this data. Um, so this is a, an isochron diagram. It's another way to plot up uh, argon data um, and get an age. Okay. But there's also this other value that comes with it. And it's a 40-36 ratio. Now, um, when you're calculating argon age, you have to assume a argon, a 40-36 ratio. Most labs use today's error. So if you walk outside today, the argon 40-36 ratio, for ratio is about 298. Okay, so they use that number. Um, if that assumption was correct, then we would get a value of about that for our intercept. But we do not. We get a value that's much higher. This is about 5,000. Okay, and I should say this is an isochron of just the biotite dominated portion of the sample. But if we then take that value and recalculate our age spectra, we can correct for it. So again, here's the, here's the bad version. This is using a trapped component or an error component of 298. If we then calculate the same age spectra with that other value, we get this. So we get an age that makes sense. It matches the age which was on the isochron. And we have a plateau that's flat and has pretty good statistics. So the way we approach this now, it's a little bit more of a, of a process doing the data processing. But we use the inverse isochron intercept with all of our data. Because we also don't want to make the assumption that the air outside today is the same as it was 2 billion years ago. Okay, so. Um, if you take the data from Nomad at all, the other paper I showed where they discard it, you can do the same calculation um, and correct their data as well. So now that we've gotten through the heavy argon part, I apologize, um, we'll get to actually showing you the data. So just plotting back up the, the published geochronology, um, again, here's, here's the zircon bedelliate and the published biotite data. Um, the only thing I've added is this vertical dotted line. That's the average of the zircon analyses, just so you kind of have a marker to go through. I'm going to add in the data from our 10 samples. Now, note that every data point I put up is a weighted mean. So it's a weighted mean of the plateau ages from a single sample. Um, it's three to five analyses per, per grain, or per sample, three to five grains per sample. So we'll plot those up there. Um, you should notice a couple things off the bat. Okay? One is that, again, these ages are fairly consistent throughout the stratigraphy. In fact, they're indistinguishable at two sigma. There might be some younging towards the bottom, but statistically, they're, they're the same. We can't tell them apart. Second thing you should notice is that they almost all overlap with the uranium-lead zircon ages, which implies, again, two things, that the whole body cooled to roughly the closure temperature of biotite at the same time, and that it must have been fast, okay? Because remember, the zircons are representing temperatures of about 800 degrees, where the biotite's representing a temperature of about 350. 
Um, another thing that points out before I, before I move on with this stuff is that we're starting to notice that maybe there's actually young things going on in the chromatites. There's two data points I didn't plot up here because they're over here somewhere. Um, but in the Marensky Reef, there are two argon dates for biotite. They're two billion years old. And then we also have these two chromatite dates that are also a bit younger. Um, and this is fitting in with some new hypothesis people are having, even from isotope work, um, that chromatites and reef deposits are conduits and traps for hydrothermal fluids long throughout their history compared to the rest of the, of the body. Um, so that's some work that I hope that can, can start to take off now with this, with this new data. But back to, back to our original data and the cooling of the body, uh, we have to now ask ourselves, is this something that we would expect? Um, so we can look at conductive cooling models, right? Some people have done this in the past. Um, some have used 1D conductive cooling models as recently as Zay et al. 2015. Um, and the question becomes, is that appropriate? So a 1D conductive cooling model, you put a, a magma chamber in the crust, you model it as a slab probably, it only allows heat to go out through the top and the bottom, okay? A 2D model allows it to start losing heat from the sides as well. Now you would think something that's 450 kilometers wide and only nine kilometers thick, that the sides wouldn't matter. But that's something we can test. Um, so here's just two models, um, two conductive cooling models of an eight kilometer thick Bushveld complex. These are at the center of the intrusion. Um, and we can go into the variables later if, if you wanna go through it. Um, but the idea is here's the 1D conductive cooling model. Okay, it cools off a little bit slower. That's the gray curve. And here's the 2D conductive cooling model that cools off a little faster. So at high temperatures, if you're worried about high temperature stuff, um, it really probably doesn't matter. They're pretty much indistinguishable from one another down to 700 degrees. But once you get below that, where we care about our data, um, they start to depart from, from uh, the same cooling curve. So for example, down at 400 degrees, uh, the 2D conductive cooling model is about an age of 2053.6, um, whereas the 1D conductive cooling model, you're down around 2050. So it's, you start to get pretty big expected age differences depending on how you're cooling off this body. So we're sticking right now with the 2D conductive cooling um, because it's, it's likely the more appropriate um, option. So now let's add uh, some data to this. How fast does, it, does the RLS cool? So I've just, this is the 2D conductive cooling model still, um, and we've added in the range of published zircon ages. And the idea is that if it cools faster than this conductive cooling line, uh, you need some other way to lose heat. And one way to do that is through advection. So if there's a hydrothermal system um, circulating, you can lose heat through that hydrothermal, uh, hydrothermal circulation going through your rocks. That's another way to speed things up. Um, so I've added uh, the mean age of, of biotites. Those are a little bit hard to see, but it's, it's right here. It's a little blue box. Um, and the idea is that this conductive cooling line just barely passes through the upper right-hand corner of our biotite ages. Um, so what's the inferred cooling rate here? Well, it's on the order of 1,000 to 2,000 degrees Celsius per million years. Uh, to put that in context, that's actually similar to cooling rates at the lower crust at mid-ocean ridges, which we know have an active hydrothermal system. Okay? And the conductive cooling model, you need an average cooling rate of around 20 degrees per million years to 100. Um, so clearly we need to lose heat faster um, than a conductive-only system would allow it to go. Um, but what evidence do we actually have of this hydrothermal system? Do we have any field evidence? And the answer is yes. So uh, there's a paper by uh, Schiffries and Skinner in 1987. And they, went, uh, they did a lot of field work looking at all the different zones of the Bushfell complex um, and investigating the hydrothermal mineralization um, within the complex. And these are all vein, vein mineralization. So there's three major stages. There's an early stage, an upper, upper infibulates facies stage. Um, that's usually at temperatures greater than 600 degrees C. And there's a middle stage, a green, green schist facies stage, that's anywhere between 300 to 600 degrees C. And these are by far the two most abundant stages 
throughout the bushveld. You can find them um, in all zones of the stratigraphy, and they're fairly abundant. Um, and here's just a, a picture from their paper. I know it's very grainy, but um, here's one of the middle stage veins um, going up through a main zone gabbro, and here's a hammer for scale. So they can be pretty thick, thick vein deposits. <coughs> and then there's one final stage, which is a late stage. It's below 300 degrees. Uh, it's a prenite pompiliate facies, and it's by far the least abundant. Um, there are lots of places in the RLS where you don't find it at all, and where you do find it, it's not very frequent. Um, so that, on the surface, is telling us two things. One, there is evidence in the field, in these rocks, for a high temperature hydrothermal system. And two, something changes. There's not that much evidence for hydrothermal circulation at low temperatures. So it may be that we're seeing, even from field evidence, that there's a change in cooling. So up here we might have um, conductive and advective heat loss, and then at some point we have to change to just conductive only, because there's no more hydrothermal system. There's also evidence for a hydrothermal system in the rocks that the Bushveld intruded into. So here's back to the geologic map, and again, this white area is the Transvaal supergroup sediments. Um, that the Bushveld intruded into. And here are all the economically viable hydrothermal ore deposits um, in the Transvaal. These are all coeval with the Bushveld complex. So if you go and date these, they're about 2050. Granted, uh, the age and certainty on these are about 50 million years. Um, but there's other ways to try to link them through geochemistry and other means. Um, but there very clearly is a huge hydrothermal footprint in the host rocks. And if we want to say that these are actually related to the emplacement of the Bushveld complex, we can sort of constrain their age as well, because we know the entire body is cooling down to 350 degrees extremely rapidly. So there's no way you can keep this hydrothermal system going um, for 50 million years. They'd have to be roughly the same age as the biotites. So there's, there's, there's ample evidence for, for a hydrothermal system um, with the emplacement of this body. So just some, some quick conclusions from the biotite work. Um, one, the argon-argon dating of biotite throughout the RLS indicates that the entire body cooled rapidly to the closure temperature of biotite, and this is likely aided uh, from advective heat loss. Uh, two, just kind of a, a, a future avenue for the, for the layer intrusions field in general, is that young argon-argon biotite ages also indicate the potential for localized hydrothermal infiltration of chromatite veins and PGE reefs. So it's, it's seeming like the PGE reefs and the chromatites have a much longer thermal history um, th that includes hydrothermal fluids long, throughout, long after the emplacement of the RLS. Um, so just, I want to show you where we're going with this now. There's a few more slides left. Um, and that's, um, I alluded to it in, in a couple slides ago that there's this change in cooling regime from rapid cooling, where you have advective and conductive heat loss, to slow cooling, where it's just conduction only. And I want to know is, can we actually see this and can, uh, through geochronology, and can we elucidate the low temperature thermal history even more? Um, and the answer is hopefully yes, and we're starting to do that now, um, staying in the argon-argon system, but looking at plagioclase, which has an even lower closure temperature than that of, that of biotite. Um, so again, we have, we have a ton of samples, all collected from, from 2014. Well, mostly these are from some of Jill's field work in 2006. Um, all the samples that had biotite also have <coughs> plagioclase, um, but we've added in a few more, so there's 13 total samples covering now seven kilometers of stratigraphy. Um, and unlike biotite, plagioclase is a cumulus phase, um, minus the samples here in the lower zone and one of the critical zone samples. And again, most of the plagioclases are going to look like this. So again, the plateau age is our best estimate of when this grain, this individual grain, passed through its closure temperature. Um, but almost every plagioclase grain also shows this complicated um, age progression at the beginning, um, which uh, I'm inferring to be from a reheating event, and that's, that's consistent with some published uh, work as well. So just to quickly show you some of the results we've, getting, we've been getting for plagioclase, <clears throat> here's all the published ages and the biotite ages again. Um, 
Note that the plagioclase data is going to be at one sigma, um, and these are not weighted means. These are individual grains of, of plagioclase, and we'll get into why that is in a second. Also, I mentioned those two really young biotite ages that I didn't want to pin earlier. There they are from the Marinsky Reef at two billion years. Uh, so here's the plage data. It's all over the place, right? Um, one, it looks scattered. Two, you might start to infer that it cooled faster from the margins to the center, which wouldn't be, wouldn't be a crazy idea. Um, but it's actually not the case. Um, so unlike biotite, we can actually calculate an exact closure temperature of a plagioclase grain as we measure it in the mass spectrometer. And we calculate that, temp that closure temperature using this equation by Dodson, um, which we have three major variables that we need to know. One is the activation energy, two is the diffusivity, and those are both um, of the grain that we're, that we're investigating. And then the third variable, which we have to assume, unfortunately, is the cooling rate. So we need to know those things before we can calculate a closure temperature of an individual grain to match its age. Uh, for the diffusion parameters, we can do that during our step heating experiments. Um, so we do that by measuring the temperature during the experiment um, and then creating an Arrhenius plot. So each one of these dots is a different step during the experiment. And from this regression, we can calculate an activation energy and a diffusivity uh, specific to the grain that we're getting a date from. Okay, so it's a really powerful tool. Um, and we do this for each of our, each of our plagioclase grains. Um, so an important part of, of doing this is that we need to measure temperature. And that's been kind of the hard thing to do during, during our experiments. And we do that using a, a two-color pyrometer, um, which measures the, the ratio between infrared light coming off of a sample. Um, this figure is just up here to show you that if you try to do this directly on a plagioclase grain, it will not, it will not work. If you do it off of any silicate, it will never work because the wavelength changes with composition. So you'll never measure the right temperature. So uh, I've been spending a lot of time working on developing this method upstairs. Um, and it's been working really well. So we, we place our sample on a tantalum platform in this little dimple. Okay? And then we heat the tantalum platform over here. Um, and that heats our sample to a desired temperature, which we then can measure off of the piece of tantalum, because the, the spectral properties of tantalum don't change as you heat it. So we measure the temperature here, and we can infer what the temperature of our sample is. And that's how we then go back and create this plot, where temperature is on the x-axis. Um, and then kind of taking this data and making sense of it, Again, we have to turn to a numerical model. So there was a third variable I mentioned that we needed to know for that closure temperature equation, and that's cooling rate. Um, and when you're dealing with, with cooling rates that are that slow, it's hard to just assume one. Um, so what I did was uh, I used a little bit more of a complicated software this time. It's still running a, a 2D model, but it's called Heat 3D, um, where you're allowed to put in the, the properties of the surrounding rocks and, and the igneous rocks themselves. Um, and it just runs a little bit better than trying to do it in Excel. And I want to thank Sharon for helping me with the MATLAB code um, to process all of this data. Um, but the general idea here is here's the intrusion, the intrusion right after emplacement. We have a huge thermal perturbation. Um, here's 30 million years later. It's pretty much uh, cooled off, you know, through the closure temperature of biotite. It's long past that, but you still have this thermal perturbation in the crust, okay? Um, and this can persist for, for about 50 million years or even more. I mean, you're past most of the chronometers at this point, but not plagioclase because the closure temperature can get down pretty low. Um, so this is, this is actually uh, showing us the conductive cooling regime. So I mentioned we want to see if we can see the cooling rates change. Well, our young plagioclase ages are actually showing us this. Um, and if you go through this, this model and you stop it at a plagioclase age and you take the cooling rate from the model, plug it into our equation, you'll find out that the age and temperatures pretty much match all the way through. So what's happening is not that the Bushveld is cooling from the margins in at low temperature, it's that this geothermal gradient is slowly relaxing through the crust 
um, and passing through each plagioclase's individual closure temperature. So it's, it's actually not, closed, uh, not cooling from the margins, it's cooling from the top down, and we're just looking at the variability between closure temperatures and diffusive properties of plagioclase. Um, so we are actually able to see the different cooling regimes of the bushveld. Um, and then just quickly, I, I'm continuing some work um, in collaboration with, with Blair Shaney's lab down at Princeton. Um, so we're trying to get high precision uranium lead appetite dates um, from various parts of the intrusion. This system has a closure temperature of about 500 degrees. So we're, we're attempting to, to fill in a gap between the 800 degrees represented by zircon and the 350 degrees represented by biotite. Um, and this work is, is, is ongoing, so I will, I will definitely keep you posted on, on how that ends up. Um, and then just to wrap up, uh, the major conclusions from the work so far is, um, one, back to the biotite stuff, there's a lack of systematic variation in biotite ages. Um, this in indicates the entire body cooled rapidly to the closure temperature of biotite. Um, two, advective heat loss from the hydrothermal system associated with the emplacement of the RLS um, is likely needed to produce these inferred, these inferred cooling rates. And then an, an initial uh, conclusion from the plagioclase work um, is that significantly younger plagioclase ages indicate a change in cooling rates. Um, so this is likely a shift uh, to conductive only cooling loss and a cessation of the hydrothermal system. And uh, I hopefully will have uh, more conclusions for you um, at my defense in a few months, maybe, or maybe next year, but uh, <laughs> well, we'll see. And that's it, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I have, so, if you have a hydrothermal system, do you think some of the anomalous ages could not just, re, you know, result in polarization or whatever, but should your discordance, like, could some of that be from hydrothermal alteration of what you're dating? Would yeah. Just hard to tell? <clears throat> no, definitely. Um, I think a lot of the data, I mean, there's also some data that's discordant that's not from chloride. Yeah. Um, so like the first discordant data point I showed had a plateau that was right about where it should be, yeah. but it still had some young ages at the beginning. Um, and that's likely from reheating. Um, there's no correlation yet that I've seen that shows like different parts of the stratigraphy have, all have reheating and other parts don't. Um, I, I have a feeling that it might be sort of localized um, at this point. Um, but sure, that's definitely a concern, and I, and I think um, we're getting to the point in the geochronology uh, community where we're realizing that the things we date, we really need to do a much better job of characterizing the samples before you date them. Um, both uranium lead and argon and whatever system you want to use. Um, the precision is getting down so small that we need ways to explain differences, and that, that's sort of where it's going. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something to, to think about. Greg? Uh, well, the magma itself is pretty dry. Um, the water is coming from the host rocks. So those, those sediments are, are limestones. Um, things like that. Um, no, it's from the fluids in the host rocks migrating through the rocks as the solid rock as it cools. I mean, it's, it's the same. Uh, it's the same order of magnitude as the, as the mid-ocean ridge. No, no, no. It's much faster than, than a conductive-only cooling model would predict for an intrusion of this size. Yeah. Carl has... <laughs> yeah.
Right. Yeah. No, I know I was focusing more on the biotype for this talk, but I, I yeah, um, and there, there is, I mean, every plagioclase grain is going to have a different anthracite content, um, and the diffusive properties are going to change with that. The diffusive properties are also going to change with the shape of the grain, whether or not it's a more spherical grain or if it's a slab. Um, there is a correlation between activation energy and anthracite content. So um, things like potassium feldspar have much higher activation energies than a, a sodic feldspar or a, or a calcium rich feldspar. Um, from, from my work and from reading through the literature, I'm of the opinion that every grain is grain dependent. Um, it's especially for the feldspars, you shouldn't just be assigning diffusion properties um, across the board. It, you really need to, to measure it yourself during the experiment. So yes, there, there are compositional differences between samples, um, but I also go through my samples on the probe and check to see if there's any zon zonation in potassium. So, so I, I, my question is actually a little simpler. Okay. There's no correlation between age variation and compositional zoning in the plant. Uh, almost none of the plagioclases are zoned. Um, it's hard to say if there's a correlation between age and composition because you're also dealing with a depth issue. So your age is, there's more of a correlation between closure temperature and composition than there is between age and composition. Um, so again, the, 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 the more evolved plagioclases tend to have higher closure temperatures, um, whereas the more calcic ones um, tend to have lower closure temperatures. And um, the age comes out with the geothermal gradient passing through that given, given closure temperature. Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> About the that's uh, yeah. Well, that would put it camp. yeah, 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 so which is too. probably my, my brain's prejudice of personally <laughs> caring about camp, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go, Mark. Huh. Well, well, it's it's intruded into a stable craton. Um, there's a number of different uh, ideas about you know what caused it, whether it's destabilization of the of the lithosphere or the mantle plume. Um, there are there are lavas, um, but again, knowing how much is has actually erupted. Um, and how much is missing, I think, is, is still up to debate. I know Jill's done a lot of work on, on that for the upper zone stuff. Um, but again, I mean, it's, it's, it's 2 billion years old. Um, we're already limited by preservation issues. Um, but you know, it's, it's a great question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the impact is 30 million years younger. Uh, two <laughs> yeah, so I mean, Jerry's alluding to uh, uh, one of the largest recorded uh, impact craters on Earth is the Vredefort Dome, um, which is located um, roughly nearby. Um, but that's dated at about 2.02, I believe, billion years old. Um, and there was a number of people when they first discovered the, the crater that um, 
thought that the impact caused uh, the formation of the Bushveld complex. Um, but it is about you know, 30 million years younger than the intrusion. Um, and I don't think that the Bushveld saw much of that event because I wouldn't be getting biotite ages that are 2055. Um, it would be. <laughs> Shoot a bullet at it and yeah. Um, yeah. Linda. Uh, yeah, um, let me try, uh, well, maybe not the same mineral, um, but for instance, uh, at least with like zircon, per se, you can also do, um, uranium, uh, helium dating, um, or thorium, I can't remember the actual system, but, uh, you could, um, then you get into the argument of the systematics of Samarium neodymium, um, with most people thinking that you can never reset that system. Um, I'm not typically on the, I don't agree with that entirely, but that would represent kind of a crystallization um, age, not a cooling age. Um, yeah, that too, and the uncertainties, I mean, can be, be much higher than, than these systems. So that's, that's another one of the challenges with working with, with rocks in the Paleoproterozoic is your uncertainties start to hurt what you can actually um, figure out. So, um, you know, it, it might be more reasonable to start applying these, these different methods to rocks that are more like camp age or something because we're starting to learn how, how quickly these, these processes occur. Um, and if we're going to start uh, using the uncertainties to our advantage uh, gets harder and harder to work on older rocks because you know an uncertainty of two million years while it's great and it's a huge improvement we're starting to learn that these things might happen in less than a million years um, so it's a it's a it becomes a challenge Do you have Do you have money? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there has been some dates on the Scareguard scare uh, by Christian Tyner, um, but again, those are I think those were from the '80s. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that that uh, this kind of is opening up a new realm of of research for the whole layered intrusions community um, in general, because um, and you've been at these meetings. We it's the same arguments all the time, and um, if we can get some new data, um, we can start to potentially solve a problem or two and create ten more questions. So, um, yeah. All right. Thanks, Jake. All right. Thanks.